So he will start with the DC bias inductor measurement theory. After that, we will have a live hands-on measurement in our lab. And then Florian will explain a little bit about DC bias capacitor measurement. So why is it important to measure DC biasing, the maximum ratings of the Bode 100, DC voltage biasing and DC blocking. And then we will also do some live hands-on measurements here. So now I will stop sharing on our site and hand over to Steve. Yeah, so thanks everybody for showing up for today's webinar. And I'm happy to be talking about uh, making DC biased inductor measurements. And so the first question you might have is, um, why do we need to measure inductors? Why, why even bother? And, and I do hear that question sometimes, and I also have lots of engineers asking me for ways to, to measure inductors. So there seems to be some uh, level of disconnect between whether we do or whether we don't. But there's actually many reasons for measuring inductors. One is that um, as efficiencies are increasing, the inductor losses have a significantly uh, more significant impact. And so we pay more attention to the losses in the inductors in order to improve our efficiencies. The inductor has a major influence on our voltage ripple, and so we're interested in the characteristics of the inductor um, because of that. I hear from a lot of companies that say that they measure their inductors because there's so much counterfeit magnetic material, and they want to try to make sure that they weed that out of their, their products, and so they measure inductors in order uh, to obtain that. And of course, there's another reason, and that is because ultimately we're doing lots and lots of simulation, and for us to, to simulate, we need reasonably good models, and the easiest way to get a, a good model is based on measurements. So for all of those reasons, we need to be measuring. Uh, and why would DC bias? So there's really a couple of reasons for that, but one is that inductors are sensitive to, to DC bias, and as the uh, DC current in the inductor changes, so does the value of the inductor. Of course, we're trying to figure out how to shrink our converters, and that means that we need to shrink the magnetics also. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to balance um, how it is that we shrink the inductor on one side with the efficiency losses and, and performance losses on the other side. As the DC current continues to increase, we start to see this exponentially rising current. And I showed it here, just measuring an inductor at 1.2 amps, 2.2 amps, and 3.2 amps. And that's actually measured um, in, a, in a buck regulator so we can actually see what the real current looks like. And so that saturation in, increases many things, but one of the things that it does is it increases the copper loss in the inductor. It also tends to increase the switching losses in the MOSFETs degrading efficiency, and also it increases EMI. And so I wanted to kind of show what that looks like using that same inductor at 1.2 amps and 2.2 amps and 3.2 amps. I drew two horizontal bars here that would make it easy for you to see a comparison. Um, the red line towards the bottom, you can see that, that I'm measuring broadband noise, the, the kind of thick, um, almost fully colored area of the EMI. And you can see uh, as we increase the current, that bar moves up. So on the right side at 3 amps, you can see at the higher frequencies that uh, that green schmutz, I'll call it, is much higher than it was at 1.2 amps. The green line towards the top shows you what the EMI looks like at higher frequencies. And again, you'll see that um, as the inductor saturates, we get lots of high frequency EMI content. And so in addition to the increased copper loss and skin loss and, and other things, we also have increased EMI. And so it's another reason we want to try to um, maybe push the inductors as hard as we can, while at the same time, not so hard that we lose our performance, including EMI. There's three ways we can measure inductors, and the first way is in circuit. And using a, a near-field probe, and in particular it should be an H-field probe, we can measure the magnetic fields around the inductor. And if we get into the right position, meaning parallel with the field of the inductor, and we get the probe oriented in the right direction so that the signal is in phase with the, the switch, um, and then integrate that waveform, we can actually see a pretty reasonable picture of what the, 
inductive current looks like. It's difficult for us to scale this because we don't actually have accurate scaling for the H field probe and also because the signals are dependent on where it is that that uh, probe is in relation to the inductor magnetically, that is. Uh, but we do know that V is equal to LDIDK, and that means we can solve for L as the voltage across the inductor divided by DIDT. And we know that the voltage across the inductor is the output voltage during the off time and the input minus the output voltage during the on time. So if we wanted to try to scale that, we could. Or maybe we just uh, could use the relative amplitude at uh, low current and mid middle current and high current in order to see what the uh, saturation looks like, and that gives us the relative magnitude of the inductance. Of course, with every measurement, there's advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of this one is we don't really need much equipment other than a scope and an inexpensive near-field probe. And of course, it's easier to change the loading because we can just use the DC loading of the of the power supply to change the DC current in the inductor. But there's also lots of disadvantages. One is that the measurement is performed inside a finished product, meaning the design is all completed. And now we're going to measure it to see whether or not it's actually any good. So um, it's probably a little bit late. We don't get a lot of detailed information. In fact, there's not much comparative information that we can get from, from the inductor. The only thing we can really see is the relative amplitudes. And while most people would probably say that EMI is a bad thing, sometimes it's a good thing. And, uh, and so there's a balance here. As they improve the shielding of inductors, it makes it much more difficult for us to see the H fields in order to get decent measurements. So um, in some cases, EMI is actually a good thing. It allows us to make indirect measurements, but as they shield the devices, it gets harder to do that. So here's an example board. This is one of our uh, demo boards. You'll find it on our website. We use it in all of our workshops. It's a Texas Instrument OM2014 buck regulator. You can see the H field probe properly positioned parallel to the inductor and in the right direction to get the waveform right side up. And then on the right hand screen, you can see what the ripple current looks like in the inductor at different load currents. And for sure, we can see that that current is increasing and we can solve that as our ripple is equal to the input voltage minus the output voltage divided by the value of the inductor. So if we wanted to scale that um, mathematically, we could. We can also use the three-port frequency response analyzer measurement. The three-port measurement uh, basically uses three uh, ports. So here I'm using the Bode 100 oscillator signal to modulate the signal that's across the inductor. And then I'm using two uh, receiver channels, one to measure the current in the inductor and one to measure the voltage across the inductor. And of course, if we measure voltage divided by current, that's impedance. So the way that we do this is we're using a, a line injector for modulation. In this case, I'm using a J2121. And, uh, and that's kind of nice because it has an integrated current probe. So uh, we can use that isolated current monitor and connect it to channel one. And then we can connect channel two to measure the voltage across the inductor. Of course, we need to calibrate this measurement. So the J2121 comes with a one ohm resistor. And that way we can do a through calibration into a one ohm resistor and that will scale everything properly. And how we control this is from the external benchtop power supply. So using a benchtop power supply in constant current mode, we can adjust the bias current in the inductor. We can set it where we want it, and then we can go ahead and we can measure it. And here you can see in the frequency domain, we can get much better resolution. We get nice, pretty pictures, and we can display them in almost any format you want. Um, so in the lower left-hand corner, I'm showing the uh, Q of the inductor. And so we might want to know where the peak quality factor is, because that's where the efficiency sweet spot is. And you can see in this particular case, we've got our peak in, in Q at around 100 kilohertz, which would be really nice, except that the switching regulator is at 2.8 megahertz, and so probably not ideal use of that inductor, and that measurement would help to tell us that. In the upper right-hand corner, we can see the impedance magnitude, and we know it's an inductor because it's increasing at 6 dB per octave of frequency, or we could display it directly as inductance, and you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner, 
And uh, of course, we did this at 1.2 amps and 2.2 amps and 3.2 amps. And you can clearly see the change in inductance. I even showed it in the display. One of the things that you might notice is that the inductance itself isn't really constant with frequency either. Um, it does wiggle around a little bit, and that's also dependent on current. You'll see that even more so in ferrite beads. Uh, maybe you're only interested in a single frequency, like the switching frequency. So um, in the Bode 100, we can do that. We can do a single uh, frequency measurement, and it'll even give us an equivalent model of series RL network or a parallel RL network. And it will also give us the Q, and you can see at a megahertz, the Q of this inductor is only about 5, right, 4.8, meaning that the efficiency at 1 megahertz isn't going to be really great. We're not utilizing the, uh, the inductor very well, and so that's a good measurement for us. Here's another example, and I wanted to show this because this is typically how we measure inductors here. Uh, we mount them to, um, to mounting boards. That's really the most accurate way for us to do it, and it minimizes contact resistances. And of course, we have uh, you know EM board files. So if we want to de-embed the board, we can fully de-embed it, as I've done here. And then we can measure this inductor again with and without bias. I set the scale to be a relatively sensitive scale, so again, that you could see how it is that the inductance moves around a bit over the operating frequency, as well as how it is that the inductor changes with operating current. And so that's kind of what we want, want to see. When we make three-port measurements, one of the things I wanted to show here, and I know this looks confusing because there's numbers all over it, but I wanted to show that there's a ground loop. And almost any time we have current flowing and interconnects, we're going to end up with a DC ground loop, and I wanted to show that here. So I created a model of the line injector, and I have a benchtop power supply on the left-hand side. And then I just have a bunch of uh, resistors that are labeled cables. So these are the resistance of the, of the shields. And I just picked an arbitrary number, 20 milliohms, and that's a moderate length cable. But I just uh, showed every cable is 20 milliohms every place that one exists. And then you can see I clearly labeled the dot um, on the right-hand side. And so I put in a one micro Henry inductor that also happens to have a 20 milliohm resistance. And I put one amp through it, and then I looked at the voltage that we measure. And lo and behold, we're not measuring 20 millivolts like we thought we would. We actually measured 28.9 millivolts. That says that our 20 milliohm dot is actually reading 28 milliohms. And the reason for that is that we have current flowing in the grounds, and those grounds actually do boost up the, the signal. You can actually see in this bottom uh, cable, the last cable that connects to our voltage probe is, that uh, the ground is sitting at 8.89 millivolts, not zero. And so one tip for making really accurate measurements is you'd really like that uh, channel two voltage probe to be semi-isolated using something like our uh, J2113 or using a differential probe. And so I replicated a differential probe here using just the DC transformer to isolate the signal. And you can see isolating that voltage signal. Now we measure the correct uh, 20 millivolts or 20 milliohm signal. So we need to be aware of these ground loops. And uh, one way to deal with those is to minimize the length of the cables, keep the weight cables as short as you can. Another way is to try to manage the shield resistance. And that's one of the reasons Pico test made uh, PDN cable is we needed a cable that had lower ground resistance than typical cables in order to do that. I wanted to show you how that actually works. Um, so I picked a, a 620 nanohenry inductor that I happen to have laying around with a 5.1 milliohm DC resistance. And I measured that inductor three different ways, one without any uh, isolation, isolation for the ground loop, um, once with a differential probe, and once using a coaxial transformer. And you can see using the differential probe, and in this case we used a J2113, we end up with uh, perfect measurement all the way down to, you could go all the way get down to one hertz. You'll see that in the blue line. Coaxial transformers aren't perfect, and you can see the effect of that at a few hundred uh, hertz. Uh, but once we get above a few hundred hertz, it's okay. And if we don't have isolation at all, you can see the red trace shows the resistance of the ground shields and finally sorting itself out by the time it gets to a couple of kilohertz. So if you measure inductance above, you know, say 10 kilohertz, you probably don't need to worry too much about the ground loops. But if you want really accurate measurements, it's something to be aware of. 
again, every measurement has advantages and disadvantages. Um, one advantage to this measurement is that you can usually measure at the operating switching frequency. Uh, the modulator will work uh, relatively well up to, oh, probably five to 10 megahertz, limited more by the cables and interconnects than anything else. Um, the other advantage is that we can use the same setup to measure DC to DC input impedance of our converters and also PSLR. So when we spend money on equipment, you know, it's not, um, it's not free. We have to pay for it. And so if we can get multiple setups out of our uh, equipment, that's an advantage. So I, I want to list that here. Disadvantages are we need external modulation of the voltage source. Um, it is a limited frequency range, so we can only modulate up to maybe 5 or 10 megahertz, as I said. Uh, it requires a high current power supply. So using the J2121, uh, we can go up to about 20 amps, but that requires that we have a 20 amp benchtop uh, power supply, which is a relatively substantial power supply. And it does have a ground loop, so we need to be aware of that. We need to manage it. And for ideal measurements or, or um, perfect measurements, we really need to isolate the ground loop. This is another method, and that's called the two-port jump through. Those of you that are working in power integrity are probably already familiar with this measurement technique because it is the, uh, the standard for measuring PDN impedance. It works really well for measuring down to, oh, tens of microns. I think we've actually measured as low as 22 microns for the Bode 100, and we can measure up to hundreds of ohms, even higher using an extended two-port measurement. And so it works really well for measuring uh, Inductors. This measurement also has a uh, ground loop, and we need to isolate that also. So you can see I have an isolator connected to channel two, and you can use either an isolation transformer like our J2102B or uh, a semi floating amplifier like a J2113A, and then we can use the oscillator output of the Bode 100 as the uh, S parameter source. Then the Bode 100 takes the S21 scatter parameters and it does the transformation converts that to impedance. I didn't go into a lot of detail here because it is a very detailed measurement, but there's lots of information on our website. And so I did provide two links if you're interested in the details of the two port impedance measurement and how all that works. So I wanted to show an example of a higher current inductor. In this case, we're providing bias power from our new J2131. The J2131 is a, a current multiplier, so it takes the current from your bench top power supply, scales it up 24 times, and it applies that to our inductor. So it's really well suited to measuring at very high currents. Here you can see the inductor mounted on the printed circuit board. You can see our printed circuit board even has heat sinks on it on both sides just to manage the temperature rise of the, of the board. Because uh, when you run these up at 125 amps, they tend to get pretty hot. But I measured the, um, the inductor uh, three ways, actually. One is I measured this this board, and I'll call it the mount, but the mount actually includes the bias source, the J2131, and also the board that we're mounting the inductor to, but not a, not a dot. There is no inductor mounted for measurement. And I'm showing that in the green trace. And so you can see this is actually an RF bias source, and you could model the J2131 if you wanted to as a uh, current source in uh, parallel with an inductor, and that inductor is a non-saturating ideal inductor. And here it is, I measured it over frequency, and I plotted that in the green trace. Then I mounted this Standex 400 nanohenry inductor, and I measured it at two currents, 48 amps in the red trace, and 125 amps in the blue trace. And so that works pretty well. Um, you can see at 48 amps, we're well within the ratings of the inductor, but it doesn't measure 400 nanohenries like we expected. It only measures 322 nanohenries, or 22% lower than we would expect, and here's why. So if I look at this measurement, as I said, we can model the J2131 as a current source in parallel with our uh, internal RF bias inductor. And then we have the little printed circuit board that has the two part measurements on it. And then you can see the dot mounted on the right. And so what we're measuring is our dot in parallel with all that other stuff. So we need to remove all that other stuff. So what it did is I created the equation that said what we measured is actually the parallel equivalent of two things, right? It's the parallel equivalent of the dot 
and everything else on the left, the dot, which is the J2131, is by a source on the circuit board. Uh, so we can write that equation as uh, measured times mount divided by measured plus mount. And what we really wanted to know is, is what the dot is. So we could solve that for the dot. And that says that there's an equation measured times mount divided by the mount minus the measurement, and that'll give us the um, exact value of the dot V embedded. If we didn't do that, we could calculate what the error would be. The error is um, the mounted inductance divided by the dot plus the mount minus one. And I plotted that curve here, and you can see that at 414 uh, nanometers, we're minus 8%, 24% at uh, at uh, 414 nanometers and at five microhenries, we'd be off by 79%. Um, 79% error is absolutely huge. So, so one of the things we need to be able to do is we need to be able to de-embed J2131 from our measurements. And the Bode 100 allows us to do that. It uses measurement expressions. And so you can see here, I presented the measurement expression to de-embed our 48 amp measurement. And that means that I used the 48 amp trace data, I multiplied it by the mount, and then I divided it by the mount minus the 48 amp measurement. And now you can see we do get the correct de embedded measurement. So without the de embedding, we measured 322 nanohenries, and now we measured 424 nanohenries, which is right where we expected it to be. And at 125 amps, we measured 105 nanohenries without de embedding, 114 nanohenries with the de-embedding, and so we've corrected for that 24% error. And the question is, how does that work, or how well does that work over a wide range of inductors? So, so here are measurements of three different inductor values, and we tried to spread them out. So we have a 150 nanohenry inductor, a one and a half microhenry inductor, and a five microhenry inductor. We measured those using an ideal two-part measurement technique, so no bias source, just mounting the inductor to a, a two-port board and actually making a near-perfect measurement of the inductor. And then we measured it in the bias source uh, with the de-embedding function, and you can see that we have an average of about 2 to 3% error. But that error is independent of the value of the inductor. So whether or not we measured at 150 nanohenries or at 5 microhenries, we ended up with about the same error meaning this is a systematic error, probably just a lack of calibration accuracy, but certainly well enough for our applications. And again, everything has advantages and disadvantages. So this does have the advantage of being able to measure at the operating switching frequency. Um, we can measure at even wider switching frequencies. There's a link here in case you're interested. Um, I was a co-author in an IEEE article on measuring embedded uh, CPU-based inductors at 600 megahertz, and uh, and this measurement technique works for that also. We don't require an external modulator. We can get the source signal directly from Bode 100, and we can also get the receiver signal directly from Bode 100, so it's pretty well self-contained. It's measured using a VNA, which has better calibration, and that means better accuracy for your measurements. We calibrate on the fly in a VNA and that allows us to get much more accurate measurements. We can connect this measurement to a source power amplifier that allows us to get larger signal AC measurements in case you're interested in actually measuring core loss or Q at the operating conditions, we can make that uh, signal larger. And it requires a low current benchtop power supply. So while we can provide DC bias up to 125 amps, we do that with a six amp benchtop power supply, so much more portable and uh, using equipment that you probably already have. Disadvantage is, well, it does require a ground isolator, uh, but so does the three-port measurement. And it requires de-embedding, but that function is a simple math equation in the Bode 100. So while you might call it a disadvantage, it's not really too difficult to overcome. If you wanted to measure those larger signals, here's an example of the setup using the, the BM12, and that'll give you a roughly a 12 dB gain increase in the signal amplitude, and that means roughly four volts RMS instead of one volt RMS. And if you wanted to use a bigger source power amplifier, well, there are RF power amplifiers that, uh, that are available, uh, but that's what the setup would look like for a larger signal measurement. So in summary, there are two simple methods that we can use for measuring frequency-dependent frequency inductance with bias. 
and I showed both of those. Up to 20 amps, the three-port frequency response analyzer measurement works really well. Uh, up to 125 amps, the two-port shunt-through measurement works really well. At above 125 amps, I am getting questions about how you measure 500 amps. It is possible to parallel bias sources. We haven't done it here yet, but there's not a reason why you can't. A few things that I wanted to highlight, and I put them in bright red because I don't want you to miss them, but one is that when you run these boards at 125 amps, it's, it's possible for them to get really hot, and we don't want, um, we don't want to be able to desolder the, the inductor. If the, if the inductor gets desoldered and falls off the board, uh, all of the energy that's stored in the RF bias inductor is going to go into your instrument, and it could damage your instrument. Uh, so one thing I'll tell you is that we want to try to keep those boards cool. That's the reason we put heat sinks on them. And also we want to try to make sure the inductor is on the top. So if we do uh, manage to melt the solder, it doesn't fall off. Another thing is that if that board gets hot, we're not actually measuring it at 25 degrees C anymore. And so we want to try to manage that temperature rise. One thing that some of our customers are doing is, um, is using automation. And we can automate both the power supply and the Bode 100. So that we can enable the DC bias, make a measurement at a frequency, and then shut off the bias. And with intervals in between the data points, we can do cooling and still in a reasonable time frame, maybe one minute, we can do a, a full sweep. Also, you might use fewer data points because we don't really need the resolution of uh, more data points, but that allows us to make uh, faster sweeps. Also, higher receiver bandwidth will allow you to make uh, faster sweeps. But the goal is to try to make the measurement before the inductor gets too hot. And, uh, and so that's the, the whole idea. I did give you some links here in case you want to go read more about these measurements. We have lots on our solution pages about the two-port impedance measurement and the three-port impedance measurement, uh, also about uh, power integrity measurements in particular. And so if you have any additional information, you'll find it there. And if you don't find it there, contact me directly at steve at picotest.com. And uh, those are the of you that know me know I really love to answer your questions, so don't hesitate. And uh, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks. I'll turn it back over to Florian and Tobias. So thanks, Steve, for the great presentation. What we are going to do first is we're going to use the J2121A, so the high power line injector, to do a three port uh, frequency response measurement of two different inductors. You can see the setup on the left hand side where current source or we use the power supply, bench to power supply and current limiting is connected to the line injector and the device on the test, the inductor is connected to the output of the line injector and the J2121 can go up to 20 amps. So that's already pretty interesting. We have two devices on the test prepared. You can see a little uh, power inductor that could be used in a small bucket converter that has a 1.5 micro henrys and 15 milliohms of DC resistance and the rated current is 4.3 amps the saturation current is 7.3 amps from the data sheet and I think they have defined uh, saturation current as the current where the inductance drops by 20 or 30 percent or something like that that depends on the manufacturer it's not a not a standardized value the second device on the test is an EMC ferrite for a line filter, for example, it has 10 microhenries, so higher inductance, and 10 milliohms DC resistance, and is rated to 2.5 amps. So Tobias is now gonna configure the setup. I've now connected the power to the line injector, so the J2121. Um, we've already done the calibration in the body file, so we use the, the one ohm resistor, which is delivered with the injector, to, do, to perform the calibration already. And so for the setup, it's actually it's really easy. The power supply is already connected, so you can see it better. Then we have uh, our device under test, the small power inductor. Then we need to connect the output of the body 100 to the oscillation input. Then we have the current monitor, which will be connected to channel 1. And then we need to measure the voltage. And for that, we use a BNC cable at the output. And so actually, that's it. Well, in that case, as a next step, we're going to we'll switch on the power supplies. Yeah. So and then it's it. <laughs> then we we'll start it. with yeah. so, Good. I opened the body analyzer suite. 
if I find it. So I think here it is. And the device is connected. You can see the green um, button, the full range calibration. We have already done that to get the flat one ohm result with the one ohm calibration resistor. And uh, yeah, we use a shaped level to uh, overcome the current difference a little bit over frequency. So since the inductance or the impedance of the inductor rises with frequency, we said we are also going to rise the AC amplitude to keep it somehow more stable over frequency. Uh, and that gives us a little bit of flatter result over frequency. You could also use a constant level, of course, but then in the high impedance range, the current will be very, very small and the measurement result will be more noisy. So to fight that noise, we decided to use more power at uh, the higher frequencies where the inductor has a higher impedance value. So I'm gonna start the measurement. The sweep is running, we are using a 30 hertz receiver bandwidth. It starts at uh, 20 milliohms and now the inductive region is here where the impedance rises with a 20 dB per decade slope. So yeah, that's the typically inductive behavior and then the lower graph we are plotting the inductance over frequency so it's um, you can read at 1.7 uh, or 1.6 micro -Henry's in that case. I'm going to reduce that a little bit, the axis to bring the scaling higher and put that to memory. That's at uh, well, 0. Yeah, 0.3. 300 milliamps. We will now go up with the current. Now we have about one amp. Go back to the body, and actually there's not that much of a difference. I think the rate of current is at about five, uh, four point three amps. Let's go to four amps. Huh? So. The rate of current is 4 amps, so we directly go up to 4 amps. So that's about 4. Yeah, not much change actually. So up to the rate of current, nothing is happening or pretty nothing. That's 4 amps. Now we further increase, so we go up to, let's, 5. Okay, not that much happens. Then let's go up to six. So then I see the at six amps. Now the inductance is starting to drop. What did we say? It is uh, rated to seven amps or seven point three amps. Saturation and at six now. I wait until the sweep is complete. Yeah. And we we'll use a seven amp measurement probably as well. Now we go up to seven. Now you can already see that the the result is changing with time. We're doing a quite slow measurement, so we can already see that the inductor is heating up a little bit. When the sweep returns, the result is not the same anymore. It continues to drop until it stabilizes at some point. Is it already hot? Yes, the small power inductor is getting hot at 7 amps, so... You, you can't touch it anymore? Yeah, yeah no. No more. Okay, so it's probably already 60 to se uh, yeah, 60 degrees C. So we're gonna stop here. That's uh, seven amps. So we can see that at this rate, uh, the rate of saturation current, the inductor is already heating up quite significantly, and we're gonna reduce the current. We don't have any cooling on the inductor in that case, so it's a very small inductor, and it was heating up pretty quickly. Uh, Steve, in the meantime, we have a question that came in. Maybe you can address it before we do. The uh, device is going to change the inductor now, uh, the second device on the test. In the meantime, we have continued to measure, and uh, Tobias has now set the current to 3 amps. 3 amps. That's already above the rated current of that inductor. That was 2.5 amps. Oh, no. So we are at above the rated current already. You can see the inductance has already dropped by roughly 20% or so. And we can go higher, I think, in that case. This one is a probably softer magnetic core and uh, doesn't saturate as quickly as the other one. And it has a lower DC resistance. It doesn't heat up that quickly. It's actually really getting hot. Now 
that's already 5 amps. We let the sweep complete, that's now 5 amps. Double the rated current, put it into memory, and maybe you can reduce the current again. So I'm going to stop the measurement. That was it. I think, let's see if there is an additional question. So you have seen that it was pretty quick actually. It takes roughly a couple of minutes to check out an inductor using the J2121. And as a next step, we're going to show how to do the same measurement up to 125 amps. I think we won't do 125, will we? No, we will go up to 70 or 80 amps because our device on the test is rated for uh, I saturation, saturation current is 54 amps. So that's the setup. Uh, it's going to use the J2131 uh, current multiplier and the shunt through measurement using the J2113 differential amplifier to break the ground loop. And Tobias is now setting up the lab. So, from the output of the Bowie 100, you go to the uh, switch on the DC, the J2131, and the power supply. And then we have to do a shunt through measurement. So, the output goes to the device under test, and channel 2 goes to the second part of the device under test. But in addition, we use the differential amplifier. 2113. If I put it here on top, so the measurement can be seen a bit better. So here we have the power supply, I switch it on, but it is set to zero volts, and therefore also the current at the device on the test at the moment is zero. So I can open up the Bode analyzer suite, and uh, I need to disconnect the Bode 100 from the other instance to make it usable in the second one. So I switch to the other screen and I can say connect the body here. So now the body is on this screen or on this uh, instance of the body analyzer suite and uh, we did already measure the impedance of the uh, DC current source, so of the J2131. Uh, That's this inductor slope as you can see uh, as Steve said, there is a, a high frequency inductor inside to block the or to give a constant impedance that we can use to subtract the amount or to de-embed the measurement and uh, take off that. I don't need it right now. It's, it's in a memory and we called it mount. And can I already start the measurement device? Yes. Okay, I'm going to measure the form a sweep here from a kilohertz. We start at the kilohertz and we go up to 50 megahertz in that case, and we can see the inductive slope on the lower trace, uh, on the upper diagram, and let's go down to million ohm here. Inductive slope in the upper diagram, and we plot the inductance over frequency in the lower diagram, and here we are at, uh, what does it say, 202 nanohenries with zero amps bias right now. And uh, to check what the mount is now changing on the result, I'm going to scale the graph a little bit to see more here. So that's our measured inductance right now. And now we can subtract the uh, impedance of the mount or of the system to de-embed the real inductance. So that we have in trace 3, we have the expression that says a trace times mount divided by mount minus trace. And as Steve said, uh, he can do it and we can do it. This is an unpublished, unreleased feature until now. So if you want to use it, uh, please contact us. It's not yet released officially. We're still working on it. But I switch it on now. And you can see that now the impedance has dropped uh, has increased, the inductance has increased from 202 nanohenries to 230 nanohenries. So that was the error of the mount. So I'm going to switch off the trace 2 and just use the, the corrected measurement for now.
I put that into memory. That's at uh, zero amps. So we can't we can't do the expression to a memory. No, it's, and you have to calculate it. Okay, so we can only do the corrected one, not on the memory. So we use the uncorrected one. We have to correct every single one. As I said, it's an unreleased feature, so I'm not yet so familiar. But can easily see the saturation of the core. And now, if you go to, I will increase the. The DC current, as you can see, one click is about 10 amps at the moment. And as I know, there is not much happening below 40 amps. We'll go up to 40, and then you can go back to the software, and we see there's not so not much has changed. changed. It's like still the same at 40 amps, and now it should come to an interesting region. Can you further increase, please? I will further increase. We'll go up to. Now we have uh, 50 amps. Now it starts to drop a little bit. Rated, so the rate of current is uh, 54, the saturation current is 54. And now we have 55. So now it really starts to drop quickly. A further increase. Now that is 60. Maybe we can go further up. What's that? 70. That's 70 already. We no. could go up further, but I think we can see that even 70 amps saturation is really high. So now the inductance has dropped completely and the inductor is saturated. It's going to heat up soon, maybe you can turn, turn down the current. So as you can see, it's pretty quick. So on capacitors, of course, it's the same case as with inductors. In switching applications or in power supply applications, the capacitors are normally charged to a DC value, and then there is some AC ripple on the DC. So it makes sense to measure them with a, in a biased state, but the capacitor is charged, which is more uh, close to the real application later on if it's used as a filter in a output stage of a converter or uh, even on a voltage regulator, on a linear regulator, it's the same, the capacitor is charged. So whenever you do measurements like that, please be aware that there are limits to the body 100 if you don't want to destroy it. The output stage of the body 100 is a voltage source, a sine wave source, and it has a 50 ohm output impedance and the maximum reverse power is half a watt. So please don't overdrive it. it. That's approximately 5 volts reverse voltage, but we don't recommend to go higher than 3.3 volts directly into the output of the body 100. And it's very sensitive to transients, so if you have transient uh, transients going in, you can kill the output amplifier. So if you're going to do stuff that uses, uh, that is, or that could create transients, Please consider using some protection circuit externally. You could use anti-parallel diodes or even a, um, how is it called, a over voltage suppression and use a calibration to remove the influence of the protection circuit. On the input stage, it's very similar. There is the 50 ohm input impedance if you switch it on, but this one is rated to a watt. And then we have the AC coupling capacitor that blocks the DC from entering the measurement channel and that's rated to 50 volts DC. So that's the maximum you should apply to the input. So that's seven volts RMS or maximum 50 volts DC when using the one ohm, uh, the one mega ohm input case. Uh, the maximum AC voltage that you can apply in the one mega ohm case depends on frequency. For smaller frequencies, you can apply up to 50 volts, but don't do it because you will not be able to measure more than 10 volts RMS. Uh, the rest will be an over overload on the channel, but as you can see, above 10 megahertz, uh, you should lower it to 7 volts RMS in order to not destroy the input. Yeah, so you won't be able to measure more than 10 volts RMS anyhow. When you use external probes, especially passive probes, please note that the inputs of the body are AC coupled, and if you have a standard 10 to 1 passive probe, then it has a 9 mega ohm tip resistor, 
and together with the uh, AC coupling cap at the input, the DC voltage will not be divided, so the full DC voltage will be present at the input, so you cannot use a 10 to 1 probe, a standard 10 to 1 probe, to apply more than 50 volts DC to the input. If you use our PML1110 probe, that's a, a 1 mega ohm design, so it has a 10 to 1 divider in the probe tip, so you can use that to increase the maximum DC voltage, uh, usable DC voltage range of the body 100, because this will also divide the DC voltage, of course, and protect our AC coupling caps. For voltage biasing, so you need to somehow protect the body 100 from the DC voltage that you apply to the capacitor, and that, uh, the, and then you somehow need to charge the device on the test. And that's normally done via voltage source and via bias resistor to reduce the current flow in inrush current or also discharge current. And in addition, it also isolates the uh, bias source from the measurement because the bias source in well, it's normally a very low impedance, it's a voltage source, and that would be appear in parallel to well, sorry, in parallel to the device on the test. So you will measure the device on the test in parallel to the bias source. When you have a high bias resistor, of course, then the error will be smaller. So if you look at the uh, error, the device on the test capacitance and the bias resistor, that's simplified, of course, in reality everything is impedance over frequency, but if you simplify it like that, then they form a parallel circuit and you can calculate somehow the minus 3 dB or the crossover frequency of that circuit and at the FC the magnitude error will be 3 dB and the phase error 45 degrees. So at 10 times FC it will be already a lot lower, so only 0.5% of a magnitude error and only 5 degrees of phase error and if you start at 100 times FC then the error is already pretty small. So the, the problem will appear at low frequencies in that case. If you use a DC locking capacitor to protect the body 100, then you can use the open short and load calibration to move the reference plane from the output of the body 100 over the blocking capacitor to the device on the test. Please use linear capacitors that are not sensitive to DC because otherwise the impedance of the blocking capacitor might change when you change the DC. Of course this will reduce the signal to noise ratio at low frequencies. If you have a blocking capacitor of 10 microfarads and a device on the test of 1 microfarad, then of course in that case you can, can see that below 10 kilohertz the voltage loss is roughly 10% in the blocking cap, so you will lose some signal to noise ratio on the measurement. There is the very simple measurement setup where a blocking capacitor is used to protect the output of the body 100 and the device on the test is charged by a bias capacitor that's a DC block, you only need one device on the test and you can say that you measure a device on the test and the impedance that you measure is going to be the impedance of the device on the test. It's very easy for low voltages and it's going to be tricky, you need a very big blocking cap, so at higher voltages it's more tricky and the DC block is never 100% linear. There is also a very elegant setup, or a very nice one, by using two similar capacitors. So if you use two devices on the test that are connected in series, then you can just charge the center point of that linear, of that series connection, and one of the devices on the test will act as the DC block that protects the body 100 and uh, that's an easy way to measure without a DC block so you don't need a DC block. It's suitable for higher voltages until the, uh, the devices don't break. You can measure also higher voltages. You need to of course uh, divide the result by 2 because or multiply by 2 because they are in series and you need two similar devices on the test so if that's an issue then that setup is probably not usable. So we are going to do a measurement example here, a live measurement, where we brought four different capacitors. They are all roughly a microfarad. You can see we have an aluminum electrolyte that goes up to 450 volts with one microfarad, then a film capacitor, 400 volts, 0.33 microfarad, 
and then a ceramic X7R with 500 volts nominal voltage uh, and 0.33 microfarads nominal capacitance. And then we brought a special Serolink capacitor that also has a 500 volts nominal voltage and it has two capacitor ratings and it says it has a nominal capacitance of one microfarad at nominal voltage and only 0.3 microfarads without any DC bias. So this one should have an inverse DC bias effect offering more capacitance when charged. We used the dual device on the test method where we charge the center point and then we have some additional resistors to protect the body 100 to discharge the devices in the test when we remove the DC voltage, that's the R2 and the R3, they, they will allow us to discharge the devices on the test even when we remove the supply or when we remove the body 100, so we did that to protect us and the device, uh, the body 100 of course. That's the setup, how it looks like in reality with the BNC connectors for the impedance measurement and the charge connectors that we have to apply the DC voltage. We'll do a one port measurement and the FC, just as a simple estimation, the ratio between the capacitors and the uh, discharge resistors is around 0.5 Hertz. So above five to 10 Hertz, we should be able, or yeah, above 50 Hertz, we should be able to measure without any significant error in the measurement. Please notice, always take the appropriate safety measures when working with passiveless voltages and connect the body 100 housing to the protective earth, use an isolated DC voltage source and cover the live parts before, such that you cannot touch them. Then please connect the complete test setup including the body 100 before powering the DC voltage and uh, don't switch it on immediately to avoid transients so ramp it up slowly. I think that's the most important things and check if the bias resistors and the charge Resistors can handle the maximum voltage, of course, otherwise we'll have another issue. And please wait until the capacitors are discharged. So we're going to do a live hands-on measurement on that, uh, up to 400 volts. That's the setup, and the bias is now starting to make the setup. <laughs> yeah. Um, we already have the device under test, as you can see here in a box so that we are protected, can't touch it. So I now have to connect the DC voltage supply. We also use an additional um, digital multimeter to measure the voltage so that we don't have, um, so that we don't, because the actual DC power supply that we use uh, do not really have a very good voltage reading, therefore we have an additional voltage meter. Um, before we start, I disconnect the USB cable so that we can do an open short load calibration. So if you could please open the body software. Yes, just checking if we have questions, but until now not. So I have to disconnect. So we're here. doing a disconnect device and then I start a new instance of the body analyzer suite. Here it is. And we said we're gonna do an impedance analysis one port measurement. We have a, a comment, cool sticker on the DC supply. Yeah. <laughs> self-made. It's a self-made supply. supply yeah. What do we do to bias? Open short load calibration. Any wishes for the frequency range? You can start at about 100 hertz to, let's say, 10 or megahertz. The setup is clunky, let's use one minute. I want 10 megahertz, okay, let's try. 10 megahertz, then we use 13 dBm, maximum power, and 100 hertz receiver bandwidth, and full range calibration. Full range should be enough. Open. Now connect short, short is connected. I click on short. Now we connect the 50 ohm load. Done. And that's it. So now we have calibrated the cable and we're ready to connect. We will start with the 
aluminium electrolytic. We connect that, close the box. Try to close the box, that's it. And then before we put on some voltage, we do it without. Okay. Let's do some zero bias measurement. What do we have connected right now? Aluminium electrolytic. Okay. So that's the aluminum cap at zero volts. And we're gonna change the reading from phase to capacitance in that case here. It's a 10 micro, no, one microfarads, and let's measure it up to two microfarads. So here we see it, see it. We measure half of it, so. Yeah, exactly. So we only measure half of the value because we have two capacitors in series. I can go to one microfarad here. And there we are. So we'll now increase the DC voltage. I'll go up very slowly. Shall we go to nominal voltage immediately? We can go start half, with half and 200. Nominal. So now that's about 200 volts. 200 volts and not much changed. Then we'll go up to 400. That's 400. Still not big of a change because it's an aluminium electrolytic. Okay, in that case, we can change the setup from the aluminum to the next one, please. So I decrease the voltage, waited a few seconds to let it discharge the capacitor. Now we will change it to the film capacitor. The film capacitor is connected. Switch on the power supply. So that's the film capacitor. It has uh, 0.33. So we read 170 nanofarads in that case. That's now at zero volts. And then I will go to half the rating. Go to 200, that's 200 volts. Nothing changed. Let's go up to 400. Film that's is boring. 400, no Nothing change. Changed. So therefore, we'll now change to the X7R. It should be way more interesting. So we see it's discharged on the one volt. Change that. Now it should get interesting. Okay, I go back to the body analyzer suite. And that's at zero volts now. Yeah? Zero volts. Now will I go up to that's just 100 volts. I'm gonna scale it up a little bit. So that's the X7R at 100 volts. The next one is 200 volts. And then to make it interesting, we go up to the 400 volts. Actually, this one is rated to 500 volts. Since not all of them are rated, we go up to 400 volts. That's the maximum that the setup can do. So that's X7R 400 volts. And that's pretty interesting in my opinion because it's rated to 500 volts, the cap and the capacitance is dropping like crazy to only a fraction of the nominal capacitance. We know that's the DC bias effect of ceramic caps. And then you can see that in the megahertz re region, something else is happening. And that's the piezoelectric uh, resonance, the mechanical resonance of the capacitor itself. When, when, he's, when it's charged, it starts to vibrate with the mechanical self-resonance frequency. And that's the, the resonance peaks you can see in the megahertz region in that case.
So I'm going to change the setup. And the last one is the server link, the special one that should increase the capacitance with DC voltage. So let's try it without DC voltage. You could open the body. Yeah, one second. So there was a question, what is causing the resonance at 700 kilohertz? So that's the piezoelectric effect. Now we are at zero volts. Zero volts. And the battery go up to 200 volts. Now the capacitance is higher, increasing. And then we go up to 400. So that's now the result at 400 volts. The capacitance would further increase if we would go up to 500 volts, but we have capacitors in that are just rated for 400 volts, so we can't increase further. Okay, so that's uh, the measurement, and we have let this switch off not in order to not kill yourself. Switch everything off. We have prepared the results for you in a slide as well. So the mechanical self resonance. It increases with DC bias voltage. We have zoomed into that picture. You can see that's pretty nasty stuff. And on the right hand side, you can see the ESR of uh, this capacitor that increases, of course, when the DC bias increases. And at the mechanical resonances, the, the, the loss gets higher. And you can see that the effective ESR is also getting higher. And it's not just doubling, it's like 100 times in worst case scenarios. So in that case, at the 800 kilohertz, it can go up to 5 ohms from the initial 25 ohms that it has at zero bias. This, of course, can impact a filter that you design with zero volts DC. That's a plot of the capacitance change with DC bias. On the x-axis, we have the bias voltage. So we ramped it up in smaller steps in that case. And then on the y-axis, the nominal capacitance or the capacitance at zero DC to the DC capacitance, and you can see that the aluminum and film capacitors are pretty flat. The film is nearly perfect. The ceramic cap drops with frequency. The normal X7R cap or class 2 dielectrics drop with frequency down to like 10 to 20 percent of the nominal or at the, of the zero volt capacitance. And the Serolink cap at one kilohertz is rising with DC voltage. Uh, another closer look to the ESR change. That's the mechanical resonances from the piezo effect that can rise the ESR pretty significantly. So we we'll come to the con to the summary slide that just concludes a little bit of today's webinar. Impedance measurements under DC bias are of course possible. They are not always straightforward, and the setups contain systematic errors that you need to correct for. You can use simulation, of course, to identify and estimate the errors, and you can use the body analyzer suite to compensate for the errors. We have collected some further readings for you, uh, and of course, there's a lot of information on the PicoTest website and the Omicron Lab website where we have some application notes. So thanks a lot for your attention.